This is very motivating to me to see this group form up again. I think we've averaged, what, about 45 people for each of the last seven years, and they have their own echo chamber, and so you get a multiplier effect that becomes quite considerable. And um, we're in the business, ultimately, of the export and dissemination of ideas about how to use civil resistance in a way that <clears throat> affects the kind of change that uh, is consistent with human rights, is consistent with uh, values associated with democracy. Um, now, before I get into all that heavy stuff, I have a pop question for all of you to pop quiz. So, would somebody like to guess how long, how many years I've known Jack Duvall? I have a 50 here, I have a 40 there. I'll try one more. What's that? The answer, the answer is 48. Jack and I went to college together. And um, as a matter of fact, we had our own radio show where we offered up contrasting political views, none of which I can remember at this moment. But um, we've been friends and, and uh, colleagues and for all that period of time, and our lives have moved in and out. And I think you know it's a tribute to Jack in that he saw this work and he introduced me to Steve York, and Steve York was our documentary producer, and that was the pivot point for creating the International Center was because it was a response to these documentaries. The visual part, like my gentleman here, my my uh, the, the gentleman who's the great drawer. I mean, <clears throat> by the way, I also wanted it as another. Um, <clears throat> source of confession. I always wanted to be a political cartoonist, but I was lacking in two skills. One, the ability to draw, and the second is the ability to have a, a satiric wit. So lacking those two skills, I wasn't able to do either, but I admire both. But um, it was the movies themselves, the visual, that basically was compelling to so many people around the world, and in effect, people came back and said, I want to do what I saw in those movies. And it became our job not to just show the movies, but to try to give people a sense of what we think they saw in a more generalized sense so they could take what they saw and ultimately see if they could apply those principles to um, their own situation. Now, um, I have an older son who was, he's a mathematician, but he's also a wrestler. Now, let's say I sent him on the mat at the World Championships and he goes and he pretends like he's wrestling and, uh, and he, bait, or, or even better, he's wrestling with a dummy, and he takes the dummy and he throws the dummy. And then um, uh, you look back and say, gee, wasn't that a great move? But you're not really referring to what the dummy was. Now, if you had a real live person, you'd be very, very concerned with what that person would do in return. And it's the lack of, in this field, and it continues, the lack of the ability to think about what your adversary is and what they're going to do to prevent you from doing what you want to have happen, that's totally critical to understanding why you succeed or why you don't. And so let me give you an example of why this omission continues and why it's almost sexy to allow it to continue. So here's this thing called Times Person of the Year, the protester. So there's two people here that on one page that they're talking about. The first gentleman is saying, walking across that intersection handcuffed was the proudest moment of my life. Captain Ray Lewis, a retired Philadelphia police officer, arrested in November at Occupy Wall Street. And then it's, um, the past 12 hours were painful and surreal, but I know I got off much easier than so many other Egyptians. Mona El Tahawi, an Egyptian-American journalist, in a tweet after being arrested and assaulted in the police in Cairo. Now, what does one have to do with the other? The fact that they both went to the streets. But that means nothing. Because just going to the streets doesn't tell you who's going to succeed or who's going to fail. So by conflating a, a tactic, you conflate the conflict, and that means you automatically make all opponents equal. And this is really something that we've been trying to work with people to understand that that is not the case. As a matter of fact, knowing how to, civil resistance is 
a behavior in conflict. Conflict comes when you, as a resistor, find yourself unable to negotiate or to, in any way, um, lessen the circumstances you live in which you deem to be unacceptable. So you're in a position of total inability to come to a resolution with somebody who must now turn out to be your adversary. So civil resistance has no meaning without an adversary. So who's the ac adversary in Occupy Wall Street? I, I, one of the problems is that I'm not sure they know. We knew who the adversary was and his behaviors. And we know we've seen that in Egypt, that adversary in a way has morphed into different things. But the awareness of the adversary is a critical element in knowing how to succeed or fail. So it also impacts the kinds of tactics you use, the strategies you use. So somebody who's rational would want to say, well, if my opponent is of this variety and, and I'm trying to create this kind of result that that opponent doesn't want, what kind of tactics do I use? Do I use violent ones or do I use nonviolent ones and link the violent ones into a strategy and the nonviolent ones into a strategy? How do you think intelligently about which to do? So let's try to see if we can start by taking a look at, at what that might be. So let's talk about what um, Erica Chenna with Maria Stefan says the most common one, some kind of regime change, not necessarily an overthrow, but something that basically changes the nature of authoritarian rule for the better. So we have a common view of the battlefield if you're a violent insurrectionist or a nonviolent insurrectionist. You have a leadership at the top. They are not reconstructable. In other words, you can't negotiate with them they simply are going to impose their will on a population whether the population likes it or not. Below them is a set of elites that are less loyal to the people at top but are well taken care of and so to a certain extent they're loyal and then these elites control bureaucratic pillars of support, economics, security, cultural, religious, you can name your pillars of support based on the particular circumstances in a conflict and they in turn have their effect on the general population. So now let's look at the theory of a violent insurrection. In the theory of a violent insurrection is we have guerrilla forces that interpose themselves between this and the pillars of support. They use their violence to basically work their way up to the elites, attack all the pillars sideways and frontally, attack the elites, ultimately to basically create the ability to kill or maim or knock, knock them out of, the, out of the equation of the conflict until the guerrilla forces become the leadership. That's the theory of that kind of violent insurrection. Now, Erica Chenoweth and Maria Stefan, who looked at uh, you know, um, two-thirds of 326 of these since 1900, will tell you that their success rate is around a quarter. Now, why is the success rate around a quarter? Well, it should be pretty obvious because at some point, the leaders will create a military. The first thing that will happen is all the pillars of support will sort of gather the wagons around the leadership because the thing they're most afraid of is getting shot by the guerrilla forces. So they will create tighter groups in terms of their um, pillars of support. The, uh, the military will then protect all of them and then counterattack, kill the guerrillas, and always, to some extent, do something terrible to the general population. Now because the power of these guys turns out to be at usually less than the power of the military, the fight is a fight that's very likely to lose, and that's what the statistics show. Now let's talk, take a different theory about dealing with authoritarian rule. Let's talk about civil resistance. Again, we have a leadership that can't be reconstructed. You're, you're in opposition to them. You cannot agree with them. You're in a fight. Remember, a fight. And then you have elites, but if we look carefully, there's little places within the elites in each of these pillars that not everybody is equally loyal. I don't think we have the graphic right. Jake and I worked on it. Maybe it should be a little squiggly line just to show there's fault lines in all these pillars and amongst the elites. Natan Sharansky called these people latent double thinkers. Now why are they latent double thinkers is because if they emerge one by one they'll get picked off by loyal elites or the military or the leadership and they'll have a bad experience. So the question here is how to get them sparked up. And, and the question here is not the tactic. The question here is how to get them mobilized. And so what does the population play in this? So let's look at the next case. So here's the opportunity. 
the population, the red square means the population, creates acts of disruption. And by the way, it's not just protests. And as I'm going to say in a minute, there are acts of disruption that have two varieties. One is there are acts of commission, where you do things that the leadership wants you to stop doing. That would be a protest. And then you stop and you do things that they would, you stop doing things that the leadership would want you to continue to do, like a strike and a boycott. So the tactics of commission are a lot riskier than the tactics of omission. And what people forget, and these guys certainly have forgotten, is that in South Africa, the tactics of omission were more important than the tactics of commission. Strikes and boycotts were more important. Same thing in, uh, just like you might say the same thing in, um, in, um, in Poland, because you had the Gdansk shipyard strike. But the point is, why would you go into a fight without knowing everything that you have available to you? And why would you actually, in that fight, not predetermine or prethink what the impact of what those various tactics would be on the mental and material capabilities of your opponent? That's natural stuff. So the idea here is that now you've sparked up the elites, you've sparked the pillars, they move away from the leadership, you, enough of the military is left so that whatever is left in the military that, that the leadership can use is sort of fades away. And where's my fade away button? There it is, okay. Two different theories. Now, it's sort of becoming obvious why in the, in the data, this second theory is twice as, has twice the success rate of the first. Why? Because as the leadership counterattacks, what they need to do is not just attack, they need to get the, the obedience, the continued obedience of the people they're attacking. The, when you're a guerrilla force, you're a non-democratic small group, and the key response from the leadership is to just totally wipe you out. Here, you can't wipe out your opponents. Your opponents, it's much stickier and it's harder to do. And so what it does is it gives Every movement, more staying power, more staying power creates a larger likelihood of success. Okay. Now, Jack didn't exactly get the story right, so I'd like to just correct a little bit. Um, when I was at Fletcher, I went over to take a course with Tom Schelling, who wrote a book called Strategy, Coalition, and Conflict. And I went up to Tom because I was a creature of the late 1960s and the Vietnam War period, and everybody was very enamored with the idea of asymmetric warfare why people who have less military capability can beat people with more. And then you read people like Sir Basil Littlehart who talks about the indirect elements of strategy, that are the non-military elements. And I said, I wanted to study this more. And it was he who told me to go meet Gene Sharp. And now the reason why this is important is that number one, he wrote something I'm gonna to read to you that's very important. Number two, he's a Nobel Prize winner. And he forwarded our first book. So this is what he said, I, I, probably now a half a century ago. It's an amazing thing if you think about it. The tyrant and his subjects are in somewhat symmetrical positions. They can deny him most of what he wants. They can, that is, if they have the disciplined organization to refuse collaboration. And he can deny them just about everything they want. He can deny it by using the force at his command. They can confront him with chaos, starvation, idleness, and social breakdown. But he confronts them with the same thing. And indeed, most of what they deny him, they deny themselves. Now, this is building up to the key point. It is a bargaining situation which either side, if adequately disciplined and organized, can deny most of what the other wants, and it remains to see who wins. So every time you hear an argument about civil resistance will work here and it won't work here, that's not what this guy is saying. The key thing here is adequately being adequately disciplined and organized. If you're adequately disciplined and organized, he didn't say you're more likely to win in this place or not. He said it's a toss-up. It's a competition. It's a wrestling match. It's whatever you want to call a competition. And when we think of civil resistance as a competition, we have to think about how do you win the competition? Well, then, um, getting back to my wrestling son, he's wrestled for many, many years, he was an Olympian, he will be told by his coach, well, there's better moves in certain circumstances, and there's worse moves in circumstances, in different circumstances. Better things to do, and there's worse things to do. I don't know if any of you read, I think the movie book was Outliers, there was a story about the youngest chess champion that exists today, and basically he became the chess champion because he spent all his young years basically doing uh, 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 computer chess. And what he said was is that, you know, I learned so many different ways to lose that when I would actually go into a real match and I'd push a, 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 a piece, 
I would start to get this burning sensation somewhere in my, and when I, and I didn't know why, but it was basically some linkage to this idea that this was another way to lose. And this, this intuition informed me of what to avoid and I became very competitive because of this. Now, the problem we have here is that when people are in a conflict, they can't play the conflict hundreds and hundreds of thousands of different times because they're in one conflict unique to their lives. So the, the only thing they could do at that point is learn from what other people have done. And, and learn in a generalized sense and basically take the equivalent down. So in a conflict, like every other form of human endeavor, you have kinds of decisions you make. And, it's, and if you're in the military, my other son is in the military, he'll tell you there's different levels of decisions. And you have to know what levels of decisions you're making, what, what, decision, what decision each decision, what issue each decision settled. So in conflict, we really have four kinds of decision making. Grand strategic, that's picking your goals, what you would call the policy end. You'd have tactical, what are the weapons I can use against the opponent. You'd have the logistical, what do I do in support of the tactical to give myself the most chance to have a variety of tactical weapons to use. And then you have the strategic, which basically links the tactic and the grand strategic based on an understanding of what your opponent will do to maximize your goals. So let's compare the civil resistor with the authoritarian. So at the grand strategic level, the most important thing to do is unify, unify around a set of goals. There was a gentleman this morning that I heard said, well, you can't get too specific about the goals you unify around because you might create more conflict than you help. And, and there's truth to that. So you have to unify, unify around goals that are simple, that people will drop other points of disagreement with you to basically sign on to those goals and understand that we'll have that battle later on when we have a more democratic society. My friend here is nodding because he lived this in real life. If you see the story about him and Milosevic, the wonderful moment when you got, when the Apoor guys got all the uh, various um, parties to try to get together, they stood up on a podium to try and furl the uh, Apoor flag. You see one guy unfurling it, the other guy going the other way, the other guy, and the thing, as much as they tried to unfurl it, the thing ended up in a knot and a twist. And it was emblematic of the fact that they really ultimately couldn't, ultimately did, but couldn't unite at the time. You have to unite around a leadership that will speak and has legitimacy for the pendency of the conflict. What does the authoritarian want to do with the opposite? He wants to co-opt. He wants to make sure that unification never occurs because if it occurs, they're, they're, he's one step behind the eight ball. At the tactical level, the key to, as we saw in my little schematic, the key here is to create activities that disrupt. Now the reasons why you maintain nonviolent discipline in these tactical acts is because you're ultimately looking to create or let's say ignite those little hyphens I had here in the thing, in the, um, in my little schematic back there, which is basically to ignite the possibilities of people defecting. Now, people are more likely to defect if they know if other people are going to defect with them. So, what nonviolent tactics do is that they, they not only disrupt the authoritarian, they create a signaling device so that others who are like minded, the latent double thinkers, can say, I don't need to be that latent anymore. Look at all these people out there doing different things. So, it's a communication. I talked to you already about the difference between acts of commission and omission. Now what's the authoritarian's response? It's to su suppress versus violent acts of repression or threats of terror. So some kind of violent response. Now to support uh, the um, civil resistor, you have logistical issues and capacity building is both offensive and defensive. So offensive ca capacity building would be how do I basically maximize the kinds of tactics? Can I outline five different ways to protest in five different parts of, of, the, of the country, the geography the, the battle is in. Can I think of different ways to boycott or protest? Go back to Gene Sharp's famous 198 methods. Can I think through all those methods and how they may be potentially employable in this conflict and how do I basically make sure I have the resources to implement them? So those resources usually surround the, the ability to have mobility. Uh, if you go and speak to my friends in um, um, not in South Africa, in, um, who, what's her name? In, uh, Zimbabwe? Zimbabwe, yes, yeah, sorry. In Zimbabwe, they'll tell you if they, if they had $2 million worth of trucks, the whole movement would be in a different place. So mobility, the ability to um, basically communicate with each other and with the population. Now here technology, is, technology plays a useful role here 
and in the communication about your grand strategic motives to your grand strategic goals as a way of basically communicating and creating consensus. So in two, these two places, they're important but not critical. So for example, if you go and look at the movie on Milosevic, the more critical way of communicating was with the sign that said Gotov, yeah. There was, how many of those did you produce? Well, I think a thousand. Yeah, so lots of them. So, so the capacity building. Now on the defensive side, the capacity building has three dimensions. One, it's um, uh, how, to, how to basically protect people physically, give them help uh, you know, if they're hurt, like this brave woman here. Uh, legally, if they're in a, you know, using human rights lawyers to get people out of jail. And then, um, uh, I'll pass on the last one, I'll do an oops for a minute on the last one, but it's, it's um, so it's, oh, and the last one is basically people who are thrown out of work, like strike funds to basically give people the ability to have some kind of economic protection as they basically protest so that they're protected uh, um, and their families are protected and they can eat. Um, now, what is the, the authoritarian's role here is capacity destruction, shutdowns and tracking. One of the things about, um, about uh, technology is that as much as that you can atomize technology to, to basically be one-on-one -on -one with everybody, a lot of countries are getting just as good as tracking people one by one. So you can thank Cisco Systems for giving the Chinese the most advanced capability to track people in China. It's pretty awful when you think about that. And then strategic planning is what, um, what you want to do is, as, the, um, as the resistor is you want to plan. And that planning is going to be a critical element here. You want to, I, I speak to people, we've done it for years, and when we ask them, well, do you know what you're going to do six months from now? And they'll tell you, no, they just shake their head. They don't have any idea. They don't have any idea to think through what's going to happen almost past the immediacy of the tactic they're going to use at the moment. Okay. So now, if you are in a competition and you want to improve your skills in a competition, what you have to do is be able to discern between good things to do and not so good things to do. So let's see if we could do that. All right, so now this is very abstract. I apologize, but there's no other way to do it. I've figured it out, but we'll, uh, we'll try. So in the upper right con uh, quadrant, we have civil resistance strategy. In the lower left, we have authoritarian strategy. The civil resistors use tactics for disruption to create a certain level of defection. The authoritarian creates tactics for repression to create a certain level of obedience. Okay, everybody have that? Get that? Okay. So now, if you're a civil resistor, what is a good tactic? What you want is a tactic that has the least amount of disruption, because remember what Tom Schelling said, if you disrupt your opponent, you also disrupt yourself. So you want the least amount of disruption to create the most amount of defection. And if you're dealing with the authoritarian on the other side, you want him to create the most repression for the least amount of obedience. Does everybody get that? Now let's say you're on the other side. What you want to do is you want to make sure the civil resistor creates maximum disruption, which also disrupts them, for the least amount of defection. And if you're on your side, you want to have the least amount of repression for the most amount of obedience. That's why the threat of terror is very, very powerful, because if you threaten terror, you don't use violence, and you get lots of obedience. Okay? So this is where the competition is. And if you can't describe everything you do in, in some way like this, you're going blind. I mean, you're, 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 you're competing on a blind basis. And then there's this wonderful moment where, if you get to a point in the conflict, where the repression grows and the defection grows because people get really mad. That sort of happened in Serbia and other places where you get what's called backfire. You can't plan for this as well, but, but somehow one of the reasons why movements succeed is because the authoritarian doesn't see they're in this quadrant and they keep using repression and after a while it just breaks the back of their repression. Okay. So now, I'm almost done and I'll take questions as you wish. Here's the important point. Every act should be seen in this light, and every act, every tactic you choose should be seen as launching another tactic that should be evaluated this way, and another one. So a strategy is sequencing these tactics, evaluating them this way over time to basically put the conflict in your favor. So here's the ultimate result. So if you could move 
if you take the green line and you can move, um, you can get A minus C. In other words, you want more A, less C, and that goes more in your favor versus D minus B. So that if, you're, if your plan is working better than their plan in successive strategic acts, over time the defection is going to grow, the obedience is going to stop, and ultimately you'll see, remember that last, um, that last schematic, is the leadership will get themselves, they'll, they'll be separated from their ability to control the, the, um, the conflict, and one way or another they'll lose. They'll lose either by negotiating with you, or they'll lose by just basically leaving, by being done, by having nothing else to do, by being what happened to Milosevic. And so, or in the case of South Africa, it was a negotiated conclusion. So that's my presentation to just, oh, so let me, I guess I have a little thing on the bottom here. So should the skillful interchange of civil resistance, resistors is disruption beats repression, and the skillful interchange by authoritarians, because authoritarians can be skillful too, is that repression beats disruption. So this is where we want to be. And um, now, I'm sorry if that is abstract, but at some level, you can't win unless you think about this. Now, one of the things we designed, and I was hoping we were going to do this in the next session, is a game that allows you to think about this. And um, I've, I've, as Jack knows, I've been on sabbatical with, for a couple of years on another project, but my feeling is that if more people who sat in Syria or sat in e Egypt, is not a good case, in, in, sits in Iran, actually plays the game, and they are doing it now, and says, okay, now let's plan with this kind of schematic or even a multi, you know, multi-variable, you know, a schematic with lots more variables, if you could plan and plan and plan, the, the chance of your succeeding will go up dramatically. And that's the basic thesis here, is that you just can't think of civil resistance as sort of like this, this act that just sort of unfolds. There's a spark, uh, I guess in the case of Tunisia, is Mary King here? Okay, how many people immolated themselves before this guy immolated himself? Well, Le Monde Diplomatique, the French newspaper, reported that there had been two earlier in the same year, and that it's a frequent form of protest. Yeah. So the point is, they, they, everybody, the reporters can only see it as a spark, a protest, and everything blows up and then they leave. That, that, that's, that's not the way you get a high, high percentage chance of winning. And so, Skills are about the ability to plan, to basically say these are the right things to do and these are the wrong things to do, based on a set of metrics that are opposition oriented. What do I do relative to the biggest impact I can have on the opposition? So, thank you, I'm done. Anybody have any questions?